we should take everything that's written in this plan seriously, deadly seriously. And I think we all have to really work hard to make sure that breaks through amid a lot of other sort of hyper politicized clutter that can make people just not know which way is up. This is Brad Rourke with the Charles F. Kettering Foundation. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan operating foundation that focuses on advancing and defending inclusive democracy. Today, I'm talking to Kettering Senior Fellow David Pepper about the role of the states in defending democracy. David Pepper, thank you for being here. Thank you. Great to be with you. In your Substack, you've been writing uh, and publishing a serialized novel uh, about Project 2025. Tell us about that. Yeah, thanks for asking. You know, I my worry is it's so long and so detailed. And I keep seeing in social media, people need to read the plan. It reminds me when people said people need to read the Mueller report. No one was reading the Mueller report, folks. And so I think all of us in our own ways, and John Oliver did a really good uh, summary of Project 2025 a couple weeks ago. My hope is people are doing this on TikTok. Uh, And I thought, you know, we need to make this more real for people. You will lose your freedoms in numerous ways if this plan happens. You'll lose your right to have a government that serves you and not one man. Um, Throw in the immunity decision and you will have a government that can commit crimes. And because the president can give out pardons, which I think he's inclined to do, and the president is is himself not to be held accountable if it's an official act, We'll have a government that commit crimes and we can't do anything about it. Put those two together. It's very dangerous. And sometimes I think, you know, again, people can do it different ways. This is I'm so glad we're talking about today. But I actually think sometimes fiction, we go back to Uncle Tom's Cabin, can do a really powerful job of making something real to people that in many other ways gets lost as political talk. So, yeah, every every week now I'm releasing a chapter of a month of what it would look like under Project 2025. Now, the story I'm making up, but the reality, at the end of every chapter, I said, this is out of page 455 of of Project 2025, what they would do to IVF, what they would do with mass deportation. This coming week is literally going to be, as we talked about, what happens when the immunity decision is combined with Schedule F when it comes to the DOJ and a president who is telling everybody in the wide open his goal is to seek revenge against traitors and his enemies. My, my attitude is we should take everything that's written in this plan seriously, deadly seriously. And what I'm trying to do through this, through this project of mine is have people sort of get a sense of what it would really mean. My goal is to capture exactly what that might look like, not with exaggeration, not with overstatement, but anchored precisely in what they are saying they will do. So I hope it helps broaden the conversation, but more importantly, make it real to people. People need to see that this is a real risk to their own freedom. And I think we all have to really work hard to make sure that breaks through amid a lot of other sort of hyper politicized clutter that can make people just not know which way is up. One of your books that I mentioned earlier is Laboratories of Autocracy, which which makes the point that that the states are really um, are, are, are not only the, the old adage is they're laboratories of democracy, but they're also in modern times have become laboratories for um, for more and more and more extreme policies. And so if that's true, reflect for a moment, if you would, let's say Project 2025 and the ideas that are contained in it are enacted by a future administration and so on a national level. We've got we've got the war against so-called wokeism. We've got all of the um, the, the upending of the National Civil Service. What does that spur these states that are laboratories of maybe further autocracy to do? What, how much farther can they go? Well, I hate to say it. Many states, and I know leaders of a lot of red states, are saying, we're already living Project 2025. Many of the, you know, the, the, uh, the, the elimination of the rule of law. I mean, in my state, I have literally a Supreme Court justice who's the son of the governor who doesn't recuse in cases involving his father. I mean, that's like, you know, not America. That's not how it's supposed to work. And we're talking about huge cases like the end of gerrymandering. Um, so we have rule of law issues in many of these states. We have, we have initiatives and referenda that pass, and the legislatures just ignore the fact that they passed. Um, we have, you know, a, an Alabama court saying no more IVF, uh, all that stuff. So in many ways, in the most extreme states that are right now horrifying a lot of America, 
it's it's not all the way into Project 2025 because it's not DOJ and it's not the military, but you start you get a little preview, and I think the answer to your question it was just, it would go further. What does further look like? A, a continuing sense that the rule of law is is essentially been washed away, that elections in in some states, at least at the legislative level, are, are basically hollow. They're, they're performative but all choice and democracy has been taken out. And, and this is what Project 2025 would do. One of my theories is once you remove accountability uh, from elected officials who have great power, which is what's happening in these gerrymandered states, there's a downward spiral into extremism and corruption. Because in a world with no accountability back to the people, you get ahead by being extreme and you get ahead by being corrupt. When you have accountability, the voters, Corruption and extremism is how you lose. But once it's gone, you literally, the next Republican primary, let's say in a, in a gerrymandered Republican state, you'll get ahead if you're the most extreme of the lot. And if you're cutting deals with corrupt players, so you get a lot of money and no one cracks down on it, you're going to win that election because you got all the money with you. And so what, what I think the next is, is just this continuous downward spiral into extremism that does not reflect the people of these states, red state or blue. I mean, look at what Kansas they overturned an abortion ban in Kansas 6040. We did in Ohio 5743. The polls right now in Florida are 7030 to support reproductive freedom in November. So you have a continuing downward spiral in these broken, unaccountable governments towards extremism. And you also have this, you know, this sort of slow, and you see this all over the world when this happens. You see it in Russia, this sort of slow but but sort of tightening corruption. It really drives everything. And it's, I, this sounds really dark. I think we can overcome it. But I think that's what you see in states that have no accountability and are over politicized and everything's about politics. And I think if Project 2025 makes it all about loyalty to one person, no accountability, no checks and balances, no rule of law, I think that kind of broken sort of uh, corrupt state is extreme, not reflective people. That's exactly where I think we'll also see the uh, president go and, and, the, and the new administration go, which is exactly what Project 2025 essentially wants. And one other thing on this, it's also why the Supreme Court decisions in the last term, beyond the muni one we all know so much about, going back 10 years, all those decisions are also sort of allowing this. You know, they're watering down definitions of corruption. They're, 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 we know what would happen with Dobbs, but there's also this, you know, they're, 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 you know, watering down the power of an administrative state that's separate from the politicians with, with the EPA decision. So all these things line up to having a, a government that is more corrupt, less you can do about it, less checks and balances. And if, if you look at states like Ohio as sort of a preview, but, but frankly, a mild preview of how bad it could really get, you see this straight spiral downward, no accountability, growing extremism, unreflective of the people, and just nonstop corruption. And one of the things, going back to my laboratories of autocracy sort of theory, the folks on top of, of sort of the right-wing politics of America, the smart ones know precisely that almost everything they want to do is deeply unpopular. And I think that's a really important insight that to know that one side of today's politics knows full well that in a normal, healthy democracy where, broad, where the broader electorate is voting and it's not gerrymandered, they know full well that they will lose those elections. If elections in America become referenda on things like Project 2025, they will lose in Kansas. They will lose in Ohio. And so I think that's a really important thing to realize that they know it's unpopular because their knowledge of their own toxicity is what shapes their entire political battle. That's why they gerrymander with such ferocity. That's why they have issues like abortion go to states where there's not as much media coverage and no one knows what state houses do versus the Senate. So Donald Trump says throw it to states because he knows, well, the unpopular things are easier to do in states that are gerrymandered so no one can be held accountable and that no one pays attention to. That's why they suppress the vote of key parts of the majority they're afraid of. They know their views are unpopular with those, pe with those folks. Uh, that's why they, you know, they attack state Supreme Courts that could hold their state houses accountable. So once you realize that they know the heart of their agenda is deeply unpopular, 
their entire battle plan of politics makes perfect sense. And my, my criticism of the pro-democracy side, and it's a self-criticism too, we've all been doing this for a long time, is once we see what their game plan is, and it's shaped by their knowledge of the unpopularity of their ideas, that should shape our game plan. If all we do is continue fighting a game plan where we assume, well, they're, they know, they think their ideas are popular, they're just trying to win elections like we are, we're going to keep not succeeding. We need to realize that their entire game plan is anchored in their knowledge that what they're trying to do is unpopular. So most of what they're trying to do, change the subject, scare their voters by saying there's crime every two years, even when it's down. All of it is to keep from happening referenda on what their agenda actually is. What would a pro-democracy, pro-rule of law game plan look like? And presumably it would have to include a coalition of people in the center right and uh, as well. You know, I, I, and I, I couldn't agree more. We saw this in Ohio in the special election. A multipartisan pro-democracy coalition um, came together in August last Ohio and saved democracy in Ohio, really, uh, 57-43. Counties that Trump had won voted with the pro-democracy side. That multipartisan aspect to it was key. I mean, the, these are largely in red states, so if it's not multipartisan, you're not going to win. Key key elements. Um, understand what their battle is, this this deep attack on democracy, and understand where they wage it. It's been grounded in states. We wa we love to watch the presidential and the swing states, but the heart of their battle has been years of, of creating, you know, as I said, mini Project 2025s in state after state. No longer step aside as they do that. Go to those places. Contest those places expose what they're doing. The media should be in these places more than they are. Don't don't have 60 people following, you know, Mike Johnson through the hallways of Congress. Have 30 do that and have the other 30 in states covering what's happening in states. Um, so see where the battle is. See that the heart of it is actually at the state level. Um, see that that nonstop erosion at the state level is what's allowed for gerrymandering of Congress and what's allowed voter suppression and to allow these states to be the places where most of the extremism is happening. So much of their, their battle is, is hinged on undermining democracy. So whether you're in Washington or in a state like Ohio or Missouri, fight to reform and protect democracy by ending gerrymandering, which we hope to do this year um, in Ohio. But if we ever have a chance in Congress, pass the voting rights laws that have been before you so that you too can help end gerrymandering. Support the voters that have been suppressed as part of their effort to keep the majority from voting against them. Do that in states when you can. Do that locally when you can. Every mayor should be working on that. Do it in D.C. Um, and, and see that the battle for democracy is all 50 states. The side that cares about democracy has thought, kind of on the cheap, we will protect democracy by winning the six states that happen to be swing states at this moment. It doesn't work. You can't allow dozens of states to atrophy in that extremism I talked about to become, you know, uh, to become non-democracy, essentially, that will pull everyone down. That will pull the national government down. And we have to stop thinking we can win it on the cheap and start seeing that the battle for democracy, the front line is all over this country. I, I, I was listening to part of Martin Luther King's speech the other day. Uh, it gives me chills to think about um, his I have a dream where he goes through the, mount, the mountains of Georgia and the hills of here. He's telling us you got to fight for it everywhere. And he says, including in the hard places, that was his message in that speech. That was his message in his letter from Birmingham jail. You've got to go where it's uncomfortable. And until you start doing that, winning a few states that are swing states a little easier, that could be, that's like short term finger in the dike stuff. But the long term gains for democracy will be when you're, ch when you're challenging everywhere, when you're giving competition everywhere to bring accountability back. And, and so I'd say in, a, in some states, you're not going to turn blue next year, and you may never. But every single statehouse incumbent should feel some accountability because someone ran against them. And when in some, some of these states, half the people aren't contested, that's why that extremism getting worse and worse and worse. You bring democracy back to start by, by doing, doing a 50-state democracy strategy and by doing it across states and not only in a few select places. Kettering Senior Fellow David Pepper, thank you for being here. Thanks so much.